Okay, I guess uh, today we are uh, very for fortunate to have Hamid Palangi. And Hamid started at MSR actually three years ago, and he had spent a lot of time in Vancouver office, and only recently he has moved here. Mm -hmm. So we are actually have, uh, happy to have him back in the building and looking forward to uh, some really cool talk. Uh, he's in DLTC, by the way, in the Deep Learning uh, Technology Center and uh, in MSR AI, and he will be telling us a lot of cool stuff about latest in image captioning. Yeah, thank you. Hey. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. So uh, today I will talk about a few language vision tasks that has benefited from scene graph parsing. Uh, this work is a, a collaboration and has benefited uh, from a lot of discussions uh, from the people that I have acknowledged here. Uh, some of them are from Bing, some of them are from our group at MSR, uh, and also across MSR AI. Uh, let me start immediately. So we have come a long way from here, where we were able to recognize cats in the videos with investments like $5 million on the CPUs from Google, to here, where we were able to run the models on GPUs and reduce that cost so that it is affordable and doable by other research groups ac across the globe, not just big industries. Or from uh, Lennet from Yan Li Kun to AlexNet to even much larger models like residual networks, this is just, I guess, 34 layers of that. There are 151 layers versions as well. And we don't have this type of issues when we train the neural networks these days. There have been a similar evolution on the language and vision uh, domain, which is a new domain. For example, for the captioning, uh, a work from Google after the success of convolutional neural networks to use the language models RNNs to build a captioning system for images and immediately later using attention over those systems, which goes through the uh, feature maps of the convolutional layers to focus on a specific parts of the image, to the work from uh, Microsoft, uh, which was uh, done at the deep learning group at that time, uh, going, uh, which was a cross uh, collaboration among the groups and deep learning group from captions to visual concepts and back, and to 2017 where the object detection systems were used for the image captioning system with the significant gains for captioning. So basically uh, all the progress on the vision has been transferred uh, into the uh, downstream task like uh, image captioning. I will come back to that evolution in the middle of my talk. Uh, so today what I'm describing is a work that started uh, since July last year, uh, which is a collaboration between our group and the Bing team. Uh, the initial plan that we had was uh, to find appropriate ways to represent images, and the goal was to apply them for the downstream tasks, which are mm -hmm. valuable to the, uh, to the research community and also to the product team, which was information retrieval, meaning that given an image query, we want to rank the relevant web pages, or given a text query, we want to rank the relevant images. Uh, the second uh, goal was to design effective alignment mechanisms between the representation of the images and the text for uh, the specific downstream task, uh, in this case IR, and also we looked into captioning. The third goal was to uh, figure out good ways to use the click data, the huge click data that is available to us as a company, which is a unique asset that we have. Uh, to build better representations both for the image side and the text side and later on to look into the grounding and reasoning between the language and vision. So basically, uh, if I want to list it out, it will be uh, 
looking into appropriate structures for the images, uh, which are more structured compared to the methods like BERT or transformers, uh, which uh, has resulted in a new task in the vision domain called SYNGRAPH generation, and then downstream tasks of retrieval and captioning. The other steps uh, which uh, uh, results into weekly supervised SYNGRAPH generation or reasoning uh, and the opportunities will be will not be the main topic of today's talk. So basically today I will be mainly focused on step zero. And I will elaborate a little bit uh, about step one and step two. Uh, so it's, uh, today's presentation will mainly cover this work that we have recently submitted and it is on the review. So let me start by introducing the task of scene graph generation. Uh, so given an image, the task of scene graph generation is uh, designed to build the systems that are effective to parse an image into a graph where the nodes of the graph are the objects in the image or their properties, like the attributes. And the edges of the graph are relationship between those entities in the image. Uh, it uh, consists of three uh, subtasks. One is predicate classification, where basically given the ground truth bounding boxes in the image, we should be able to predict the type of relationship between those bounding boxes. The scene graph classification, which given the bounding boxes in the image, without any information about what type of object they are, we should be able to recognize the object inside the box and the relationship between those two boxes. And the most general and the last step of this test will be scene graph detection, which is the most challenging part. How to det detect appropriate objects in the image, I mean the bounding boxes, and recognize their categories and also the relationship that they have in one given image. The largest scale data set with the full annotations that is available to us today for this type of tasks our visual genome, which has been released a few years ago from uh, Fei Fei Li's group at Stanford, which has a rich set of annotations for all the regions in the images. So here I am showing like 50 descriptions for the 50 regions of the image. And these descriptions has been used to extract the objects, attributes, and relationships across the whole data set. Uh, which, for instance, if you look into one image, it has up to 50 bounding boxes, for example, here. And the methodologies to build a, a model to generate, to predict those object categories and relation categories, uh, there have been various methods proposed, like uh, from the Mm, message passing from Stanford. It was one of the initial ones, neural motifs from UW. Or it's a still an active area of research by itself to basically build the effective models for parsing images into scene graphs. For example, this one was one of the initial models that we looked into, which uh, creates two sets of neural networks, one over the edges, another one over the objects. And it uh, does a specific type of message passing between the nodes and the edges of that graph to learn the appropriate representations of the edges and objects and finally predict the so-called scene graph of this specific image. Or methodologies like this, which are more intuitive uh, after the Fei Fei Li's work, which basically uh, they look into the bounding boxes and objects in the image in a context, and they create contextual representations for the objects, and they use the information of the triplets of the union box of the objects and the objects themselves to be able to predict what type of relationship exists between two objects. For instance, is it, posi is it uh, for instance, uh, the positive like has, or it, there is no relationship between them? So this, this task uh, is usually evaluated based on the recall on 
the different subtasks of the scene graph generation. Uh, and uh, usually the most important metric to look into is the scene graph detection because down the road we want to be able to uh, parse the whole image into the bounding boxes that we don't know where they are and also their relationship. However, usually the split of the visual genome, previously people were looking randomly on the splits that they were creating on that data set. The new standard split, which is a smaller split of the visual genome created by this work, has 50 relation categories, 50 edge categories, and 150 object categories. And usually all the people that do the research work, they evaluate their models across uh, uh, different models that has been published before on this specific split of the visual genome. However, if for our work, our goal was not just to design some new scene graph parsing models, but our goal was to how to benefit from this type of parsers for the downstream tasks that we care about, like IR or captioning or VGA. Uh, therefore, so as a first step, what we did, we used the same split of the Mm, 50 relation categories or 150 uh, object categories, which did not result into semantically good features for the downstream tasks. Then we studied a little bit more about what are the caveats about this split and what should be done to uh, make them useful for the uh, real world task that we care about. One caveat is the following. So if you look into uh, those predicates that has been shown here, many of them are like geometric predicates, which are very easy to guess from the visual features like the location of bounding boxes. They don't need a lot of semantic information or they are positive. So it is obvious in a natural language that any house has a window. Or, uh, but the semantic ones are the more challenging types of edges to detect. Uh, there was this follow-up work that uh, what they have shown is that if you totally disregard the visual information coming from uh, the bounding boxes and the image and just use the word embedding of the name of the objects, the source and target, and some information about the location of those bounding boxes, you will be able to predict a lot of relationships on the visual genome data set with a high confidence. So their hypothesis was that if you're able to recognize those predicates with this type of methodology, um, it means that they are easy to guess. They don't need a lot of visual information. Therefore, they are relying on biases on the data set or priors on the data set. This work is from uh, Jingdu research. Go ahead. Yeah. So POPJPS is the <coughs> bounding box relations yeah, yeah. for the subject, object, and the unit. So it's, a, it's like a, a vector with the uh, x, y, and the width and height. Okay. Yeah. No, no visual information, basically. So in fact, this part can do the processive and the geometric information yes. relation quite well, but cannot do the semantic. The semantic ones, yeah, are not possible. Uh, and the, the, uh, the methodology to basically recognize it was quite uh, mm, uh, simple manual rule of if you are very confident about the type of relation that you are predicting based on this simple model, then that is not semantic and that might not be useful for the downstream task. So they were able to uh, start with the a huge number of object categories and huge number of predicates and reduce them by clustering uh, the similar uh, predicates together. Because in the, uh, there is a little bit of details about the data set, it's so noisy. So uh, there are a lot of things like where's, is wearing a, or uh, those type of predicates that should be combined. And then later on, they removed uh, from these 180 predicates to about 117 predicates by this rule of thumb. Uh, however, they threw away the images that had this type of predicates only, which is not a good thing. I will come back to it later. They reduced the size of the whole data set from 100K to about 58K images. But this showed that uh, if you use this type of semantic features, it will be more richer in terms of the information that it carries for these semantic relationships. And then, yeah. So why not directly use, so in your motive you showed 
do they already classify the relations into geometric uh, positive and the semantic? Why not just use those semantic relations <coughs> between this one instead of using this filtering process to uh, tr uh, to get the clean data? Yeah, that's a, that's a that's a good point. There are some, all of them are not just positive and geometric. There are some of them that are also easy to guess in the other, because there is a other category as well, semantic, geometric, positive, and also other miscellaneous categories of the predicates. So some of them are covered by this type of mechanism. So this was just another work that has been done. That, okay. Uh, and basically, they converted the distribution uh, over the split that was usually used to a more balanced distribution. The interesting observation, all the matrix that was reported using previous methods, they dramatically dropped using this method, for instance, from 27 to something like 14, which showed that this data set is more challenging and there are a lot of biases and priors in the way that the scene graphs are generated. So this is about the caveats about just using that data set, training your scene graph parsers, and try to use it in your downstream task. It does not usually give the best performance that we expect. So back to the initial uh, introduction that I had. So we started from large scale convolutional neural networks pre-trained on ImageNet, later on on larger scale data sets. Then we used just one feature vector from the last layer before the softmax. Later on, we used the conv layer for the attention mechanism. And then we used them for the different downstream tasks that we were interested in. Later on, we were able to complement that using the methods like faster RCNN to propose regions in the image to us to use the object, objects that are recognized in the images and their corresponding feature vectors for the objects that we are most confident about, top end objects. And then simply use the list of feature vectors that we learn from these object categories on the image for the downstream tasks. Conditioned on the fact that these objects are pre-trained on object detector for, with so many object classes, not just 50 or 80, maybe 1,500 or 600 that results in a more semantically rich information. So we followed the same approach with the same hypothesis that if we pre-train a model on a larger scale of the predicates, let's say 500 predicates, we should be able to get semantically rich information about the edges on that scene graph between the objects and use those feature vectors for the corresponding downstream tasks. Very simple. Just pre-train your scene graph generator on the visual genome. And if you have a downstream task on Coco or Flickr, parse the images using that scene graph generator to a scene graph and use the feature vectors of the nodes and edges for your downstream task. Which uh, initial version that we tried was to use the edges of the image that we are most confident about along with the objects of the image that we are most confident about for two of those downstream tasks, which was the retrieval that we care about and the captioning. So the initial architecture that uh, we had was uh, as follows. Given an image, we parse it to the objects in the image, which could be a number of bounding boxes let's say here, eight. And then using the attention mechanism, we create attention weights between the representations of the objects in the image and each single word in the query that is coming through the search engine, or vice versa. If there is an image that is coming into search engine, we find the corresponding attention weights between the objects in the image to the, each word uh, in the corresponding list of web pages that we have. And we use the simple, uh, uh, common actually, uh, uh, ranking loss function. And for each word, for each object, we calculated an attended version of the all objects in the image with respect to that specific uh, word. For example, if we have, if you are calculating the attention weights for the word on, 
uh, with respect to feature vector um, V1, we basically have those attention bits for all of the objects in the image, and we create a weighted representation of the whole image based on those attention weights. And then finding the cosine similarity between that attended representations and the word representation and fitting it to the ranking loss function. And with a similar uh, approach, we added another attention weights over the edges of the scene graph which basically here we have the set of attentions over the edges of the scene graph with a slight difference, adding a gating mechanism to show what is the importance of each word with respect to each of these attention rates over edges or nodes. And the intuition is that usually each word either is a noun, which is an object, or is a predicate, which most probably is a relation. So to see if the model can automatically align these type of differences in the words to different nodes and edges in the scene graph. That was the intuition behind that. And then aligning these attention weights over the relations and over the edges, creating two separate representations of the image, which is a attended image representations over the objects, attended image representations over the relations, and then using a gating mechanism to fuse them together to find the cosine similarity between them and the word, and having an importance gating per word to fit it into the downstream cost function. Very simple mechanism uh, just to exploit the feature vectors that we learned over the edges of the uh, scene graph. Uh, so here I am just showing the details. And with these simple mechanisms, we were able to uh, observe significant gains over the baselines that we have just by exploiting these type of features over the relations uh, and the interactions between the objects, uh, which we evaluated on Flickr dataset, Coco dataset, and different variants of the evaluation on the Coco test set. Another uh, uh, exploration that uh, we performed was to, uh, to investigate how much we are doing in terms of recognizing the good semantic relations compared to just finding some random statistics using these neural networks over the uh, downstream data set that we have. So we took the 5,000 test split from Carpathy on the MS Coco and we filtered it out to just include the pairs that include one of the uh, 117 semantic relations in visual genomes that I explained how they are created. And then we mapped back these 117 semantic relations back to 259 relations in the original visual genome because some of them were clustered together. And among these four categories that uh, we just discussed, we found that majority of the relations in the VG, this was also a known fact, they are easy to predict and they are geometric to, and positive. And out of these 259 relations, about 164 were the semantic relations that we focused on. And we created a new test set for the COCO that we call R COCO that focuses on these type of semantic relations that if there is a new scene graph generator that is recognizing the interactions between objects and the objects can be evaluated on this uh, test set. This one will also be released with the final work. And we also evaluated our models on this uh, specific split of the COCO that we created and it showed the uh, performance gain compared to uh, the uh, original baselines that we were looking into for the retrieval. Here there are a few examples that I would like to go through some of them. There are some interesting observations that we had here. Uh, so a few of them, these are cherry picked. So there are good examples, bad examples. I show a few bad examples as well, but this Two, these first two are cherry picked basically. So the RS scan is the model that is proposed by us. The scan T2I is the baseline model. The query that the user puts into the search engine is a bike attached in front of a blue bus. So as you see in the second image, there is the bus 
there is the bike, but there is no notion of attachment, but our model has been able to capture the notion of attachment. Or here, the query is a cat sitting on the top of bench. There is two notions of like bench and cat, but there is no notion of the sitting on, which is captured by the model. Or this one is the top five results coming from the ranking model. If the query is a picture of a giraffe drinking some water, so in all of them we have a giraffe, in some of them we have the water, in some of them we don't. Uh, but the notion of drinking has been captured by our model. So these are just some cherry pick examples. These ones are more interesting. So for example, this one is a success case that we had. So a little dog is jumping up the, towards a frisbee someone is holding. So the notion of holding is captured here, but not here. Or the little girls are at the table decorating the case. So the decorating is another activity that is captured by our model, not the original baseline. Or this is another success example. This one is a failure example, which is an image of two girls walking with umbrellas. Here, in both pictures, we have five girls. And this is actually a very difficult problem in across many language vision tasks. We have observed it in VQA as well. The models usually are bad at counting the number of people in the image. So both models have failed in that scenario. Or this is an, uh, these two are another two success cases where touching noises has been captured here, or touching heads has been captured here compared to here. These are some examples of the text retrieval where we upload an image and we want to retrieve the text. Please remember that the task has two parts. One is the text retrieval, one is the image retrieval. The model has two parts as well. We have a text to image model, we have a image to text model that sometimes we assemble them, sometimes we don't. We can use each of them separately. So this one is the second task, which is the text retrieval, which shows some success cases like Playing with a toy in a grass ride uh, compared to sitting on, the playing has been captured correctly. Uh, and this one is also a success example. This one is a failure. Uh, both models has been capturing this one uh, as talking on her mobile phone angrily, which is not the case. It looks she's happy and laughing. So uh, the type of annotations for the emotions are not available uh, for this type of tasks yet, which is a future work that should be done. And now back to the historical point that I made for the captioning. So we had this evolution of the captioning systems, but there were a missing piece which was looking into the relationships between the objects and the edges in the scene graph which we simply complemented the previous model from the Microsoft uh, to a model that is enhanced with these type of features that we extracted from our pre-trained models. And we were able to get a uh, performance boost on the captioning. These are some examples. Uh, for example, a man standing on the side of a road is what the original model without this type of edges was generating. And our model was able to recognize the repairing as an activity, repairing a traffic light versus a standing, which is the wrong uh, annotation. Or this one, a couple of men standing next to each other or sitting next to each other, like a standing versus sitting. Uh, So up to that part, we were able to, pre to use whatever we had, what we had. It was just the data set called Visual Genome with 100,000 images. A lot of expenses for annotating that image, different regions of that, which is very expensive to do uh, for uh, uh, the, if you want to make it larger scale. But 100,000 images in the scale of a product like Bing uh, is small, it's very small. So the challenge was how we can capture this type of annotations without investing a lot on annotating each region of the image in the same way that it was done on the visual genome. I showed you the picture of the girl with an elephant. There was 50 regions and each region had a description. That's too expensive to collect. 
So this one uh, resulted into a work that we are currently looking into how to use uh, the notion of weak supervision to somehow create weak or noisy labels for the edges and objects in the image. Meaning that, think about it, this one, this example that I'm showing you is a captioning model. It has five captions per image. That's the style of the COCO data set. But think about it uh, in terms of the Bing. Like there are millions of queries uh, that is submitted to Bing, which people are searching for something. And we have those paired sentences and images. And uh, the task is that, can we create rough, noisy uh, sketches of the scene graphs given each paired image and sentence? And then pre-trained or scene graph generator model that we have currently, we have pre-trained, on those noisy labels. And then fine-tune it using just a small set of the full annotation that we have for those type of data. We are expecting to observe significant boons using this type of pre-training on the noisy click data, but this is the current exploration that we should do uh, to improve those type of parsers that we have created. As of step two that I briefly discussed, I want to give a very uh, quick historical note about the VQA. So VQA started from Microsoft uh, with releasing a data set on MS Coco called Visual Question Answering, uh, which was asking interesting questions about an image or the cartoon images or the natural images and selecting an answer. It has two tracks, multiple choice tracks or open-ended track that you should select an answer from a vast number of answers in your vocabulary. After releasing this data set in 2015, uh, people figured out this data set is so biased. Like for example, 41% of the questions about the sport is the answer is tennis. So, or if, you, if it is asking like counting questions about the data set, like in the 40% it's just two. Or like the yes, no questions was fully a scoot, like the 90% was just yes. So if you just say yes, 90% of the times you're right. And this resulted into a balanced version of this data set, which was a follow-up work of this work, uh, which had the simple logic of uh, adding another image to the set of whole images that result in a different answer with the same question. For example, here we have a, who is wearing glasses. So here the answer is man, adding another image that there is a lady who is wearing the glasses. Or uh, in this example, is the umbrella upside down, a yes or a no. So this resulted into a more balanced pair of um, questions and answers over the images. However, both of them, in all of the models that was trained on them, they had this, uh, interesting issue that is shown in this example. So if you look into this example, the model, the question is, the question words are fed one to one to the model. And when the question is are, the answer is military. And then there is are they, the answer is yes. So it does not matter what words you put after are they, the answer is always yes. Or here, after the two words, reading the two words in the question, it comes up with an answer which is summer, uh, which basically means that these models are not able to read the whole questions to come up with an answer, which makes it a big question mark, are these actually appropriate for reasoning tasks that they are claimed for? Or they are just using simple statistics of data set to come up with some answers and... Uh, um, so those resulted in an improvement into this type of data sets, which is called VQACP, VQA with the changing priors, uh, which basically what it does is that it, in the test set, it uh, tries to resolve those type of uh, re um, relevance to the biases by, for example, what color is the dog. In the training, usually it is white, but in the testing, there is a black dog as well. Or is the person wearing shorts? The answer is no, but here the answer is yes. So adding these type of examples to 
sort of evaluate the models uh, based on the balanced, uh, based on the um, uh, more fair set of testing examples and uh, penalizing them for ignoring the whole context or the questions or relying on the language priors. In parallel, there was another data set uh, developed by, uh, again, some of the people who were original developers of COCO and VQA called Clever, which looks very uh, complicated and complex when you look into the questions like, are there an equal number of large things and metal spheres, or what size is the cylinder that is left of the brown metal, and uh, very, very long questions and very complicated questions, which was designed for the compositional reasoning and relational reasoning as well. Uh, however, a few, a few months after releasing that data set, there was this work from DeepMind that they, were used, uh, they used a simple relational network on the top of the clever data set, and they were able to pass the human performance. Uh, one of the reasons was that the questions in these data sets and the images were artificial, and also they were machine generated, which makes it easier for a simple uh, neural network like this to crush it. And this year, this, this is relevant to Chris' talk uh, last week, Chris Manning talk here. Uh, there was a new data set that was released, which is using, uh, which is extensively using the notion of the scene graphs of the images of visual genome uh, to create a question answering, visual question answering task that does not have all the issues that this type of task that I just explained had. And the notion that basically the way that the data set was created was based on a program that uses some linguistic rules to go over the scene graphs of the images to remove some of the edges, remove some of the objects, come up with the interesting questions or rephrasing the questions to end up with the same answer. For example, uh, these are some interesting examples. Like the questions are like, are there any codes in this image? These are from the GQA, yes. Do you see a red coat in the image? No. What did I do? Uh, okay, you're right. Um, or what is the place that, uh, compared to VQA, so where is the bus driver? It, it is even hard for me to say that. Or why is the man in front of the bus? We don't know. So, and usually when you look into this VQA, don't think that the answers are like a long sentence explaining what is going on. Now, about 89% of the answers are just one word, uh, which makes it a little bit trivial compared to the, this, the type of questions that are, again, machine generated in this data set. And there are a huge number of uh, questions in this data set which rely on the relations a uh, number of 28% uh, of them relying on the attributes uh, and other aspects of the annotations available in the visual genome. So these are all because we had that data set. We could use it to create this type of reasoning task. And it resulted into a number of interesting matrix that were not used before in the VQA system. Previously, it was, for instance, in the VQA2, it was based on the human agreement. There was 10 human annotators, and based on the agreement between three of them, the, one answer was selected as correct, or other answers were uh, overruled. Uh, here, there are a few other notions that because the notion of structured representations of the image is used to create the data set can be used. For example, the consistency across the entailed questions. If the question is like, is there a red apple to the ref of a white plate? You can ask the entailed questions about that, which the answer can be inferred from the same questions if the model is able to do well in these questions or the plausibility if the answers are plausible in the real world natural images from visual genome. For example, if there is a question about the color of an apple, usually green and red are possible, but like blue, if it is not a specific type of apple, it is not possible. Or uh, if a question is about a relation, looking into all the triplets that is available in your scene graph to see if it is plausible in the whole data set. Or the matrix like grounding, uh, comparing the attention rates with the boxes and also the union boxes for the relations. 
So these are all, poss they're all possible because uh, the notion of this structured representation was used to uh, create this type of data set. Um, so a few concluding remarks and also what, what is ahead in terms of this work. So what, what I explained today was mainly we pretend some larger scale scene graph generators. They were very useful in terms of downstream tasks. They created very rich semantic features. We were able to address hard queries that we were not able to address for the IR task. And we created our own split of the visual genome, which has a specific number of objects and relations, which will be released. In terms of the retrieval task, we developed a model for image text and text to image retrieval, which got significant gains and the shipping is in progress in the Bing. And we released the RCOCO for the evaluation of the models that are using these type of models. And the captioning, which we just added the missing piece for the captioning models to predict the relations using pre-trained scene graph parsers. But there, are, there is a lot of work ahead of us. That was just the initial exploration that we did to see if this type of representations could give any meaningful gain beyond that a small split of VG that people evaluate their new scene graph generator models on? Uh, the answer was yes. So we extended to the following steps, which is like, uh, which is even much more difficult than the initial exploration that we did. For example, in the weekly supervised uh, um, scene graph generation task, it is still, uh, uh, open research problem, how to exploit this larger scale clique data. It involves a lot of uh, noisy and missing labels in uh, those type of uh, sketches and how to expand a visual genome ontology without using a lot of human in the loop annotations, using the clique data or the pairing of the text and images. And what are the useful approaches to use this type of imperfect information for pre-training? For the reasoning and beyond, there is a lot of uh, ongoing efforts, uh, not just in our group, across different groups here as well, uh, that given a query, how we can reason over a scene graph? This has been a question that in the NLP community, people have been looking into it uh, extensively, like over the knowledge graphs and giving a query to the knowledge graph. But here, the type of problem is a little bit different because this is just a graph over an image, not the whole knowledge of the whole images in the data set. And how to overcome the biases in these type of systems? I just showed you some examples. There are even severe cases, more severe cases of the biases in the uh, VQA system and also in the scene graph generators, which are derived, uh, which are derived from the uh, data set that they are pre-trained on. And another question is that is that, uh, so I showed you like a historical note to, from different versions of the visual reasoning systems to GQA. But again, the question is, is GQA enough? Like even for the GQA case, we don't have any counting questions in that data set compared to VQA2 that we do. And uh, we don't know what is the, if there is a new model that is um, built on the top of the GQA, we don't know what is the performance of that model on the golden scene graphs, not the predicted ones, which results into this question. Is that data set just a data set to show how good you are in your vision backend? Or that data set is a data set that helps you to see how good you are at reasoning over those golden scene graphs. So this, this type of exploration is not done yet on this data set as well. And also the questions, more broad questions, how to embed a type of like the common sense into the scene graph generators, or you want to, when you parse these images into those specific structure representations, is there any way to embed the world knowledge into them? Uh, we don't even have a clear definition of the common sense uh, still, I believe. Uh, and, uh, that's all I have for today. Questions? Yes, sir. Um, I'd like to understand, is there um, an agreement in this field about what do people mean with reasoning? Like, 
how is a perception question different from a reasoning question? That's a very good question. I don't think so. Because even the examples that I showed you, for a long time, people were trying VQA tests and they were thinking that they are building models that they are reasoning. But after these uh, uh, examples were shown, it was shown that the model is just using simple statistics of the data set. At least for the GQA, there is some hope because the questions are generated programmatically. Beyond the models, I mean, like say you have no model at all, just by the task definition. If you ask things like what color is the apple, then you would, would think that it's a, just a perception question. Mm -hmm. It's not reasoning about anything. Mm -hmm. But maybe if I have a pile of oranges, a pile of apples, and I ask are there more apples than oranges, then maybe that requires a little bit more reasoning because I have to detect both and reason what is larger than what. Like, is there a hierarchy about how much reasoning needs to be made in order to answer a particular question? Yeah, that that, one, is... that can be achieved by classifying like the type of questions that you are answering. There is that type of hierarchy available on, the, on these data sets based on the types of questions. The clever data set that I just showed, that was originally designed for this type of reasoning. Uh, however, a simple model like Relation Network was able to perform quite well on that because it was not natural on the natural images. So I believe on GQA there is a very clean uh, hierarchy about the type of questions that can be addressed by that. Uh, yeah, please. What about video? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So there is the only thing that I know is uh, there might there must be more works. Uh, there is this work from Antonio Traballa. Traballa. How do you pronounce it? Traballa. Traballa. Yeah. yeah, and it is called Movie QA, which they basically is based on the events on the videos. Uh, that's the only work that I know in that domain, to the best of my knowledge. So there might be more works in that. Do you domain. think it's harder or easier? It depends how you define the task, right? Okay. So if it is just finding the events in the video, uh, because in terms of methodology, so it's hard to evaluate the systems, like how, how good they are doing in terms of, are they really doing some reasoning or they're just using, they're just ex abusing your data set that you're providing for them. Uh, yeah? um, I have a question with regards to like the examples you gave. Um, given the, the latest um, model where you incorporated like the scene graph information, the relation information. Like you showed, for example, the woman with the angry, uh, the caption, with the caption of the woman like on the phone angry or something like that. I was wondering if you kind of examined it by, for example, just masking out certain parts of the image and then generate captions for this and then masking out certain object like things more and more to see how the caption then also degenerates in something more simple, in some sense. And if, like, then actually captures what you would assume. So, for example, if you would mask out the phone, like, would it still say that the woman is on the phone? Or if you mask out the face, if it would still refer to its emotion? Did yeah, you do anything like that? No, we didn't. That, that would be a very interesting experiment to do. Yeah, so I think a lot of the research in this area deals with making the distributions in the data more fair. Mm -hmm. And you raised this point in your very last slide in the sense that instead of just tweaking around with the data sets, what else can we do with the models? Do you have any ideas along that line? Because I think that given a subject and an object, a lot of times the relationship between them is obvious. Mm -hmm. So in some sense, if I say you are you are holding a glass of water, It's everyone might assume that you're drinking it as opposed to throwing it, you know, just statistically, that's the most obvious. And even humans would do that. Mm -hmm. So what's wrong if the model's doing that as well? Yeah, that's, that's a, the, so the question is that the data is biased, so, what, so the model will learn from data. So is there any effort to remove this type of uh, uh, issues uh, with the data by the modeling, not by just changing the data that is fed into the model. Yes. All right. So there are some efforts for that. There was one paper at NIPS last year. They were used adversarial training to 
uh, reduce the effect of language priors that is coming from the question side uh, by having two branches, one over the both image and question, one over the question only, and uh, by having a, a, special, a specific type of cost function, they were able to reduce the uh, impact of this type of priors, showing the performance on the VQA with changing priors. Uh, so this is this is a this is a well known issue even for the um, object detection or relation detection as well because I didn't show the distribution but it is usually long tail and is very common. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to follow up on the question about when what happens when the system gets something wrong. In your experience, how do you deal with that case when the system gets something wrong? How do you fix it? How do you know what to fix? Uh, or it's like, okay, it's wrong. So, so, <laughs> so the question is that, is there any way to debug the system to see if there is the issue and fix that part? That's a very difficult question. And usually, unless you build some uh, models that are, that have a specific notion of compositionality that some of the folks here are working on, so that you know that if you are doing bad and a specific type of queries, just go and fix that specific component in your model. Beyond that, it would be uh, difficult to do the debugging of the system, at least at the moment, um, unless there might be new tools developed by VESA that could help. Would it be fair to say that even though it seems that in the case of the, the seeing graph generators, that they generate those entities or relationships. You don't, you cannot make any assertions as to the model really sees them, or understands them, or reasons about them. It's just, it's an output that may not even reason about it in terms of features. Uh, if it is over, yes. So, so uh, if I understand the question right, the question is that. You want to know if the gains are coming from the, uh, if, if there is a mistake that the scene graph generator is making, uh, how to fix it, how to know which part is wrong, uh, or the question is about the VQA system. Right. Which one is it? Either. I mean, if it gets it wrong, why? Is it because it is blind in terms of the features that it's, it's operating with, and are any of those features the part of the output it's giving? Like, you know, I, the fact that I this relationship is detected as a holding um, is incorrect. Mm -hmm. And because, I don't know, I detect these two objects correctly, and I see them on top of each other, it is, it is erroneous for me to, to try to, to reason on how the, the model thinks, uh, but I'm trying to see if there's any, um, in your experience, work in that area, how to debug based on what it sees and what it doesn't see. Yeah, to the best of my knowledge, I don't know about any work that they debug the models based on the mistakes that they make on this type of task. Um, and how to do that is also another critical question like, uh, how to go back from, because think about it, it's just a classification problem. We have a bunch of annotations about relations and objects, and we just find, we just select one of them that that softmax layer has its highest probability with. But then going back and see why we made a mistake, um, there need to be some mm, new breakthroughs in that area, in my opinion. So the thing is, with debugging is that it's an overused term in a way. Like we mean a lot of things when we say debugging. It's it is about identifying the error, finding why the error is happening, and fixing it. Okay. So the thing is, identifying the error. Yeah, there are tools, and we're building tools for identifying that. Finding out why, as Samit said, like a lot of times, this why goes back to the statistical nature of the models. If you try to reason statistically, your output is also going to be statistical. And we can get away with it in perception questions, like, you know, is, is it an apple, is it a plushy toy, or things like that. 
But what, what Hamid is suggesting is that if you want to do reasoning in some form of definition of reasoning, you cannot rely as much in statistics as you can in perception. So many times this why goes back to that. Now, how to fix it? I don't know. Uh, so I'm wondering whether um, the graph structure is uh, sufficient for the purposes that you're talking about. And uh, for this question, I think it's useful to think about video also, because uh, when you try to uh, express um, the meaning of utterances in a graph, then you need to posit a lot of abstract nodes that stand for things like events. So um, there is a lot more than just binary relations between objects. There are relations between events and, and you know, people. There are uh, different kind of participants in an event. And so they, these participants have different relations to the event. But in a, the kind of uh, graph that you're talking about, there are no event nodes. There are only nodes for uh, things, right? Um, and even simple things like, you know, uh, the boy is watching the girl eat an ice cream cone. You can't represent that in a graph. It's not, it's not consisting of, of uh, binary relations. Uh, there's a girl eating uh, an ice cream, but then there's the boy watching that whole thing. That whole thing is what is the uh, object of watch. So um, mm -hmm. there's just so much more uh, richness to the structure of the meaning of, of uh, language. And to the extent that these pictures are supposed to be carrying that same kind of information, uh, then that should apply to them too. And in video, especially there are you know events that uh, last for a certain period of time uh, and have various participants in them and so maybe in a static image you don't have as much need for the notion of something abstract like event but I would think in describing videos it would be pretty essential um, so I'm just wondering about whether like, a graph is really a satisfactory of representation for what the kind of information that you are uh, wanting. Uh, yeah, so uh, there are two things uh, for this question. Two, there are two aspects into that. First, we should think where those annotations are coming from that I showed you, objects, attributes, edges, relations. They are coming from the descriptions of the regions in the image. They have been a worker. They have drawn a rectangle in the image saying that Somebody is eating something. Another rectangle, by the way, they are sitting on the table. Another rectangle, and so on. In the video's case, we have the descriptions of different frames of the videos weekly using the subtitles or the events of the videos. If someone sits down and figure out how to use those type of annotations to, to convert it to this type of uh, annotations that are useful here, then a graph can be created that includes the events as well as the activities and the objects, which will be a much more complicated graph compared to what I describe here, which is just simply regions in the image, the relationships between them, or the properties of those boxes. Um, and, uh, the, the views example you are giving also requires some, some real world knowledge, right? Not just the... the, the Perhaps, but I mean, yeah. if you show me a picture of a boy watching a girl eating an ice cream cone, I want the caption to say a boy watching a girl eating an ice cream cone. It's not necessarily a new task. But, but the problem is different people may look at the same image and we'll image will describe it differently. differently. Sure. Right. For me, the maybe I will just describe the boys watching the girl, but not watching the events. So this kind of ambiguity, I'm not sure it, it, it is subjective or objective. I, I think we can, at least I only expect machine learning model to capture some objective sense, but for this kind of well, subjective. That, that's, that can't possibly be the right distinction, objective versus subjective. <laughs> I mean, uh, you, you would, there's no way you can justify that distinction, I don't think. Um, 
But we're always in a situation of whether we want the tasks our AI systems are doing to sort of capture the mass of easy junk, or we want it to capture the hard stuff where the interesting things are happening. So yeah, some people are going to look at that picture and say, there's a boy watching. Somebody's going to say, there's a boy. We don't care whether the, the AI system is coming up with captions like that. We want good captions, and not necessarily uh, do we get good captions every time we ask a person to give one. So uh, I, I don't think that this is a reason to avoid fa facing the problem that I mentioned. I think that, I think that binary things are not limiting <clears throat> for that example. I think that you just have to have a richer notion of a concept of, hey, there's recognizing a girl eating ice cream, and then you can just have watching an activity. Well, and that's so, what I so said. You could so do if it. you want to do it with graphs, you have to have abstractions. You can't right. do it so in terms have, of things. Right. But that's like the, the, the set of entities or concepts that you're trying to do recognition of. And right now, they're, they're, like, they're flat. But it seems like it's pretty easy to go up one level and then be able to do that. So, OK, so. Uh, with binary relations. Yeah, so binary agree. is not going to be a problem, but it's like, they, but you're right. Maybe it's just I, the abstraction is that, like, right. you want to in, incorporate an ability to have abstraction and talk about the next level and maybe further than that. It's so, just a natural language where you have the notion of a word, a phrase, and, and you also have a topic. So it's a, it's a different level of abstract. Right. Yeah. I, think the, I think just, just yes, what I think it's, like, the, yeah, just, just a small comment. Like, the thing is that the state of the art before that was that the caption could as well say the ice cream is eating the girl. Because it had no sense about the relationship of who is doing what and like that, that didn't exist. I guess what the graph is adding on top of that is that type of, you know, at least directional relation that is adding some more semantics to the caption. Mm -hmm. So, so, I, I, I think I think the course mentioned for that is some relationship with the, your mission for the uh, conclusion conclusion slides show for that regarding for the conclusion slides. <laughs> you mentioned for the visual common sense. So I think oh, okay. yeah, course mentioned for that is some relationship for the visual common sense. I see. Top. I see. Yeah, top you driven for the visual common sense. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think uh, following post uh, question, I think the graph network is at, uh, so the graph I can actually represent a lot of stuff, but it just depends on what kind of representation representation you want to construct. So for example, the same graph is more like entity and uh, relations. It's just the entity is basic bounding box object or whatever. But if we in the next level, we might build some more complicated qualitative representations, like, um, for example, for videos or something, you could describe um, what actually the relation between part of the video or something. You use more complicated representations, so it could be binary. And uh, if you get a good representations for that, you could use, I don't know whether it's binary or something, but it could be used a graph to structure structure to represent the information uh, that could be enough to uh, recognize something or do multiple tasks. I still think it's interesting to think about what kind of concepts are hard to, and graph is hard to capture. For example, the boy is looking at a girl about to fall from a chair. She hasn't fallen yet, but she's going to fall. The concept of she's about to fall, I would argue, is very hard to capture. There's a notion of connect to Andy's comment of temp te time and temporality uh, that I'm not sure how easy it is to capture with uh, a graph structure. So I think it boils down to if there's a way to articulate a concept in a computable way, uh, a graph will capture it right. But I think the problem is that that computability of, of certain kinds of concepts that is hard, uh, that machines will have a really tough time doing, and we do not because we have all this experience uh, with us. The same goes uh, to Andy's point. I wonder if you know three-dimensionality of an image falls into, into a concept that they can capture something on front of something, behind something, far away from in, in depth space. Um, so there's all these, all these 
family of concepts that I think we're still just scratching the surface as to how to articulate and how to represent. And that's another one of the challenges I think we have in front of us. Like for example, in planning communities, right, like temporality, right, like reasoning, planning ahead to do things, and you can only do things once you have done certain things, or certain things are only valid until some precondition has been met, like singular temporal logic, like linear temporal logic, like there are all these like abstractions, like, you know, symbolic reasoning, right, um, they, they work really well, but in this very nice, sterile environment, right, like, you know, I can do really like very high dimensional, uh, 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 much of a very long horizon uh, planning uh, for for representing all those uh, concepts, but then they are not grounded with with this rich high dimensional spaces, right? And, and that by itself is is is, is an ongoing um, war, right? That we are trying to, as a community, trying to figure out, right? Yeah, and also I, I think for relation detection, they are different levels. Why is just to do detection based on 2D images? Why is based on 2.5D images, which is you add a depth uh, channel to the image? And why is really you can only detect actions based on videos, not really you need to consider the temporal variation. So I think maybe a good uh, uh, research to ask is also what kind of relations can be answered by 2D images? What can be answered by 2.5D? What can be answered must be uh, can must include the temporal information. Um, just with regards to to Paul's comment, um, I can make a simple example in which an image retrieval kind of um, a model based on a scene graph like this would fail. And it's simply if you would ask, uh, you want an image of a girl that is just touching something large, right? Well, that's not going to work because the girl is always in contact with, in the scene graph, is always connected to another object. And large itself is not going to be an object, but it's going to be an attribute of an object. So in order to now find an image that it has to retrieve, it has to do a reasoning step. So it has to figure out, okay, is the girl actually touching something? And is that thing actually large? So that's where as, like this binary relation would kind of break down. But there are graph queries as well. Like, I mean, people in databases have done this since forever. Like, I have a query structure, and I want to query the graph exactly with that structure. Like, you know, you have these three concepts, they are related in this way, and you and query for that. And then you add an ours, yeah, and then, yeah. and do a query. Yeah, it's know. just a, one more graph query. Yeah, but you would have to construct then the mechanism that does this additional graph yeah, query. Yeah, yeah, those yeah. things, you know, in graph relational databases, they do exist. Yes. Now, yeah. try to put it in your network. <laughs> sure, but yeah, I think that's like a big challenge, right? Like you know, yeah. that that is very super well defined. You can that's do all cool. kinds yeah. of relational yeah. queries, very complicated ones. But now you have to like put this into a, a representation sure. that allows us to do that, right? right. With, which is the war, yeah. right? Yeah. Like semantically wise, I think the graph can do it. How you make it queryable with the true neural network is yeah, I think going back a few points here too, the, the other thing that I'm struggling a bit with is understanding sort of the downstream task. Because if the downstream task is to, for example, generate a good capture, then even working with binary relationships and even working without any abstractions, you know, you can structure that in a way that, uh, like you could say, the girl is eating the ice cream cone and the boy is watching. And that's semantically very similar to saying, you know, the, the boy is watching the girl eating ice cream cone. But it's really just a trick of letting the, the user sort of fill in the, 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 the sort of common sense or, or fill in the, the, the missing gap. So, like, I feel like without even doing any reason, I mean, there may be strategies that can be played that are well tuned to the downstream task. And, and, and so I'm still not quite sure what the right construction is for like nodes in the graph that require some sort of abstraction, but I'm not sure that's it yet. Like the concepts, yeah. by abstraction you mean concepts or activities? Right, exactly, right? Like I think that even if you just create a simple, uh, you just reorder the, 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 the caption in that case, it might make perfect sense to a person, but maybe it wouldn't uh, be so good for, for, for a retrieval task or something. So I think having a notion of the downstream task is really important because people mm -hmm. can fill in the missing details. Okay. Um.
Um, Matt, you had a question? Yeah, well, I guess I just kind of wanted to... I'm kind of curious about the idea about just having the scene graph at all. So I'm very, like, sympathetic to the idea of having this nice discrete scene graph that describes the image. But sort of analogizing to NLP, you know, there was these efforts, like, with constituency parsing and dependency parsing and stuff to make, like, a, a discrete kind of graph structure that would then help you on a downstream task. Mm -hmm. But those typically didn't end up helping in downstream tasks, as long as the downstream task sort of had a good, you know, enough data, the kind of throwing that out and just doing, like, LSTMs ended up, you know, generally defeating those I sort of that, discrete yeah. things. So I'm kind of curious, like, you know, is this is this sort of an intermediate step, and then later, like, if you had a downstream task with enough yeah. data, this would actually end up proving not to be useful, or is it different somehow? Uh, is, it, is the analogy, you know, broken? But this yeah. kind of intermediate representation that's hopefully useful later, um, like, I would love for that to be useful, but sometimes it proves not to be useful. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. So the question is that the structures that we are building here is very similar to parse trees that have been used in NLP community till recently uh, after neural networks and BERT and transformers that everything is just uh, trained end to end without using those architectures is giving better results. And here, like, before using this type of architectures, people were using the objects. You might mention that you just want to put a transformer on the top of the object features without any structures of the scene graphs, etc. Does it work better? Or this approach will be the dominating one? There is one essential difference between this type of scene graphs with the scene graphs in the uh, NLP uh, that we were creating. Because here, we are actually pre-training those feature vectors for each of those nodes and edges on the larger scale images. Each of these bounding boxes, there is a convolutional neural net on the top of them that is pre-trained on another larger scale uh, image task, either take it as a classification or other task. And basically, but in the NLP, we are just using the structure. There is no notion of the feature representation pre-training under each of the nodes and the edges of the parse tree. This might be one reason that these scene graphs might be the dominating uh, structures for the downstream tasks, but we don't know. We have ongoing explorations to figure that out. Yeah, you uh, know, the PHA, the name and recognition is very important, but for many, many tasks, also the parser might not be as good. Yeah. Yeah, and also sure. I mean, in NLP, we have the words already, so we yeah. didn't need the pre-trained CNN that like tells us what's a girl and what's a boy. But but if you take that pre-trained CNN as saying, okay, this identified something, it's like you've replaced. If you replace the bounding boxes with the words, mm -hmm. and now you're saying we're gonna, we believe it's useful to create a, a a discrete graph structure over those words and then create the caption, as opposed to just directly creating the caption, like I. I mean, maybe it's more useful, and I, I thought it would be an NLP too, and then it, it kind of wasn't. So, I, I don't know. Just what I think what Hamid is saying is that the words themselves are embeddings of, vector of like outputs of CNNs. Yeah, they're features in themselves, right? So he's not really feeding in the the graph structure concatenated in sort of like girl, boy, and with the on, he's feeding in the features representing those in that high dimensional space, right? You mean like in, in the graph, it has the actual feature output from the pre-trained yeah. model, right? It's not just it's not just like a single discrete value, like man, yeah. it's like this, this thing. Each yeah. object is represented as a vector. Sure, but yeah. still, like that was already there, right? What you're adding is the, the, the edges and the relations between those, right? The but in natural languages, you, you, you have the sequence. Some, in some sense, you already have the structure. It's a very simple structure. The sequence is probably sure. the most important structure. Uh -huh. Here, without the relation, you don't have any structure. You have a simple structure. You have XY coordinate at each box. All day, I have I mean, that's, a, that's <laughs> a but then, equally But then, Matt, an, another follow-up you might say, you might say that even the transformer is also learning the relations between the words, right? Yeah. The self-attention that is used there is also, and you might argue that if you use a transformer, are those relations using self-attention that are learned based on solely the downstream task are better than this type of things that are based on some general purpose labeling for the objects and relation. Yeah, I think so that might, that might that be the argument be, why yeah. the, the, the hand-labeled may not have performed as well because it's not specific to the downstream task. Mm -hmm. 
learning on the downstream task alone, it can figure out what, what relations mm -hmm. are actually the important parts of the task. Mm -hmm. In fact, there are many works where you take an architecture like a transformer and then or a graph neural network, and then you augment it explicitly with extra edges or extra relations that are similar to the parse tree or in this case in general, graph generation. But you don't touch the rest of the transformer. It still is allowed to learn any relations it wants to. It just bias towards the ones that you extracted manually. Mm -hmm. It does add an improvement. It improves. Yes, it does. It does. Because we are at 4.30 and we are going to lose the room. So, yeah. um, please thank the speaker. Thank you.